There's other people that might be coming in late. It's all good, though. We just want to uh, get started. Let me get my phone together here. All right. So. You ready, Renee? All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Explore Bible Study. Make some noise. We are glad that you're here. Those of you watching online, God bless you. Thank you for joining us. You could be anywhere, but you're here with us, so we're grateful for that. And we thank you. We are almost to the end of the year, y'all. Can you believe it? Almost to the end of the year, and everybody's getting ready for January. I'm ready for, like, 2024. I'm ready to go. Um, no, we're, we're excited about what God is going to be doing in the next few um, months here at the center, and uh, we're just uh, looking forward to everything that God has in store for us. Um, but it's awesome because we need to begin to talk about offense. I think offense is something that um, is a killer in our lives, and it stops us from doing a lot of great things because we're offended. So last week, uh, Prophet Marisol did a phenomenal job. Did she not do a phenomenal job last week? She did an awesome job teaching on um, the uh, offense. And, man, let me tell you something. I did a little uh, diagram on uh, the headache and all these things while I was sitting there listening to her. So I hope you guys are taking notes when you're uh, here um, for Bible study. But what I want to do is just open up in prayer, and then we will get started, okay? So let's just go before the Lord. Yahweh, we thank you so much for just the opportunity to come to this place and learn more about your word, learn more about how to deal with uh, ourselves, Lord. Lord, we thank you because you are constantly um, just revealing more of us as we learn more of you. And so I pray that tonight, Lord God, as we learn about the spirit of offense, that we will begin to ask hard questions and begin to understand that, Lord God, offense is not from you. It is from the enemy. And so, Lord, we thank you that you even give us the opportunity to be here together to glorify your name and to learn more about who you are, your attributes, and what your word says toward your people. We thank you for it, and we give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. As always, we're going to ask you to uh, give online, so that will be done at the end of uh, the uh, gathering here. And then as well, it will be popping up periodically as we teach. And so I want to talk about the spirit of offense. And I brought out the whiteboard, so we're going to be taking notes today, all right? So the first thing you want to do on your notes is write the spirit of offense. What is the spirit of offense? Because it's not just an emotion. There's a spirit behind it. Amen? And so if we don't understand that, remember I told you I'll be talking about the spiritual side of things. Prophet Marisol will be doing the spiritual and psychological and emotional things. And this is all going to tie in today as well. So I think it's important for us to really have a clear understanding that offense is not just physical, but it's, I mean, not just uh, on the physical sense, but it's on the spiritual sense as well. So if you're feeling offended, it can affect the spiritual side of yourself as well. So offense is not just an emotion. It could be a spirit attached to that emotion if you allow it to grow. So the spirit of offense is a feeling, is feeling resentful, okay? Resentful, that's one of the words. Feeling resentful. Because of an actual or perceived insult. So it could be actually an insult or it could be a perceived insult. Either way, it is a resentful feeling towards something that was done towards you. And how many of us all in this room can agree and online that we've all been through something that has caused us to feel resentful? I resent that person, I resent that situation, I resent those people, I resent that church, all these things. I resent my job, whatever it may be. It becomes a place where, guess what, resentfulness is where the spirit of offense 
lives. It lives here. So this spirit lives in when you feel resentful. This is where it lives. All right? And as it lives there, it's so funny because sometimes it's an actual insult. Anybody ever had a real insult done, thrown at them and they're like, man, I resent that. Like, that was not nice. But then sometimes it's unintended by the person and yet you still catch offense to it and you become resentful over something that was said that was unintended. I know many a times I have said things unintended. Maybe you have said things unintended. And somebody else caught offense to it, and you're wondering why that person has an attitude with you. It's not that you said something mean or that you said something in a way for them to resent you. It's just the fact that that person was dealing with something, and they perceived it wrong. They didn't say hi to me. I'm upset. You know, why did um, why did Apostle go by and say hello to everybody at the table, and then when, he came, when it came to my table, he dashed over to the other side? Maybe because somebody called my name or whatever it may be. So it's very interesting how when we're dealing with offense, we will make up super amount of excuses and scenarios to fit the bill of what we're going through, right? So we, we want to make sure that everything that we're doing fits that bill. So if I'm offended about something, guess what? I'm going to make sure that everything that I talk about fits what I'm going through. And so if it's, if it's not what I'm going through, I don't want nothing to do with it, right? So a lot of times when we're offended, and I've been there, where somebody wants to tell you the truth about why you're offended, and you don't want to hear it because it's not coddling your resentfulness. It's not making you feel good. You're, it's actually digging deeper into the situation of why you're going through what you're going through or where you're at. And so we have to be careful that we don't misinterpret things that are being said to us. And the best way to misinterpret something is through a famous thing called a text message. You just don't know what they're saying through a text message. But in a text message, you can read, you can literally read something that says, wow, and all of a sudden, like, oh, it's wow, it's wow, that's what it is, it's wow. And when that person could be literally be like, wow, like, they're trying to, like, be like, oh, they said wow, they don't even care. Like, the text message is the worst. That's why I like to just text jokingly. If I had to say something, I will say it, but the text message is the worst. You'd rather talk face-to-face. -face. I've learned that in the last seven years. That's the best way to do it, face-to-face. It may be awkward. You might not want to talk to that person. You might not want to look at them right in the face. So what? Say it looking down, but say it. Eventually, you're going to be looking at that person, okay? So there are many opportunities, ready, for us to be offended. Many opportunities. We could be offended every day from the moment we wake up to the time we go to bed. You can get offended at everything. But offense, watch this, becomes a problem and moves into, watch this, so you have a fence, all right? Here's a fence. It will grow into what we call resentment. And then from resentment, it becomes a door. Y'all catching this? To the spirit. Spirit of offense. So, in all actuality, when are we supposed to kill this? Here. That's where it should die. If it gets here, it's harder to kill. And once it gets here, it's over. Because now it's not you controlling it, it's a spirit now that is residing on the fact of your resentment. So now you've gone from, well, I'm offended, to I resent that, to now a spirit is controlling you. And we don't even know it's a spirit that's controlling us because we think we're just offended. Anybody, you catching this? And so what happens is this. When we don't attack the offense 
the offense becomes a resentment, but really what you say is, I'm hurt. I'm hurt. How many of us have said that? They hurt me. I'm hurt. This hurts. Right? So we use that word hurt instead of resentment. Because resentment sounds a little bit more aggressive. But if you say, I'm hurt by that person, then you could find some people that will, what, coddle that hurt. And eventually what happens is this. If we nurse it long enough, it becomes a wound. So you nurse it long enough, and then it becomes a wound, but a wound that is not healed. So now you've gone from offense to a wound because you did not deal with the hurt. It became resentment, which allowed the spirit of offense to keep an open wound. This is how it happens. And here's the thing. You want to know something crazy? Okay. There are, like I said, valid reasons for this. But in all reality, most people are at this point because they perceived it. So imagine how much of a deception that is to you that the enemy will have you live in that lie so that he can keep an open wound in your life. It didn't really happen, but you made it happen because you perceived it that way. So these are perceived at times. So you have valid ones and perceived ones. Now, your valid ones, yes, you're going to get offended, but you got to learn how to deal with it. Your perceived ones, you got to really realize that, okay, here's the thing. Valid means it was, it, it's reality. Okay? Valid is a reality, and many of us have had valid points of, resent, of, of offense, right? Perceived is not reality. It's a lie. It's deception. So this is deception. And the first place that this plays with is the mind. So where do you think the spirit of offense lives? In your mind. Because what are you doing? You're dealing with every time you wake up in the morning, if, you, if, if throughout the day you can't go a day without thinking about that person that offended you, you are now perceiving things that aren't valid, but you're making it bigger so that you stay with an open wound. And so all of this happens when you allow the spirit of offense to reside. You got to get that spirit of offense out. Now, at some point, we start, it starts to consume us. It consumes our thought life. It affects our ability to walk out our God-given purpose with God. It stops us. Go ahead. My, uh, I just have a question. How do you determine between reality and perception? Did the person really cut you out? Did the person really tell you off? Or did they just walk by you and you just perceived it? Now, if there's a conversation and somebody is really digging in and they're getting at you and you're really feeling offended by what's being said or whatever, then that right there is a valid thing. But if I just walk by you and you get offended because I didn't say hi and then it becomes something where now you're thinking about it and it's constantly being something that is in the forefront of your mind, you have perceived it and now deception is bringing you into this place. Um, I think one thing to really ask yourself to figure out if your offense is perceived or valid is to listen to your language or your thoughts when you're thinking about that thing. Like the perception or the offense that's perceived sounds like, well, I feel like you just X, Y, and Z. Or I don't know, it seems like you X, Y, and Z. Where the valid is, no, you said yeah, that's X, the difference. Y, and Z. You did, yeah, it's like the I did feel it. like, or I think, or you just make me feel like, or it seems like that's the perceived. And that seemed like, or that like, well, 
I feel like that's what they did. Or I, that's a perception. You're actually throwing something on that person that is not true. Now, if that person did do that, then that's the reality. So my question is that if, if let's say someone does approach and says, I feel like, or it seems like, is that person wrong for still addressing you? No, they're not wrong for addressing you. Maybe they just want to get that feeling out of them because they don't want to remain offended, even though you might not have done nothing. Remember, I told you before, I've done nothing to certain individuals, and they come to me, and they feel, they be like, you remind me, you made me feel this way, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, I never did that, but if that's what it needs for you to get healing and for you to move forward, then okay, that's fine. Tell me what you feel, but I didn't put that on you. So how so how is it fair for the next person, right? Um, like for instance, we'll use you as an example where yeah. multiple times people have been offended with you yeah. due to the fact of their past trauma. Yeah. How is it that you approach or better yet respond to that person's offense when you clearly you just didn't do anything wrong? How, how do you asking how I do it? Like, like, what's the best way? Like, I, I, I you said for me you, personally, I just let it roll off my back like water off a duck's back. Like, for real, I do. Why? Because I didn't do anything. Yeah. I will listen, and I'll be like, okay, I understand how you feel, but if I genuinely did not do anything, why would I put that upon me to make me feel heavy when I didn't do it? You know what I'm saying? So yeah. And that's happened plenty of times. Welcome, welcome, Prophet. She's alive. She's doing well. Uh -huh. She was going for like uh -huh. two days. I'm like, where's my baby at? Where'd she go? Uh -huh. She disappeared. Um, thank you guys for praying for me because I don't like being sick. Um, but pray for a lot of people because um, it's empty today. I know a lot of people are not feeling well, but pray for them. Um, so offense is sometimes tricky because it's like okay is this kind of borderline and then you know how he's describing it but um i think the more that we healed the more we're able to uh hear yeah. the other person's heart and so like he said that many times people can be offended by him or me, and we didn't even know, and it could be because of the past, or it can be a, a perception of um, we can be mean in this sense, or it could be something that's happened to me that I've said something to someone, and they took it, they took it uh, offensively, and when they had a conversation, they said it sat with them for a while. And so when they would see me, they would try to hide. <laughs> so they wouldn't they have to. They were nursing it. <laughs> right. They were nursing so it. they wouldn't have to uh, deal with the situation. But then when they finally got the courage to speak to me, they realized that it wasn't, it wasn't me trying to be mean to them. It was just me saying something and they received it in a way to it could have remind them of their their mother or their father yeah and so we have to look at it like okay it's people are human and 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 there's grace for everyone yes i think that's where it helps us to love people because um Everyone has a process of healing that they need to go through. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. So dealing with this, we're going to talk about some reasons why we get offended. All right. We have one more question. You have one more question? Go ahead. So when you were talking about there's the offense, the resentment, and then the door to the spirit of offense. Yes. You were supposed to attack it better right there. Right here. Um, but then 
I heard you say once you get to the door to the spirit of offense, it's over. Well, it's not, Is it like not that it's over. It's, it's just hard the to fact really. That it's hard to get back from that because now it's not just your flesh. Now it's a spirit, spirit attached that to is, it. Is, yeah, that's on it, and it's like even if you want to get off of it, it's because now at this level here, mm -hmm. you need deliverance. At this level. Yeah. At this level, you're dealing with your flesh and your mind. And so it's like, okay, I can, if I can get my mind right, renew my mind, talk to the person that offended me, get this thing together, I'm going to be good. I won't get into resentment. But once resentment comes in, that's where the mind games start coming, and then that opens the door to this. And now you're going to need deliverance because you know what you did also? This is crazy, but this is what you did. You were offended. Say you're offended with... Uh, uh, I don't know, Joey, right? Now, you're offended with Joey. You're resenting Joey, right? And now the spirit of offense has caused an illegal soul tie to Joey because you couldn't deal with the offense in the beginning. So now you get deliverance. You got to get deliverance not only from the spirit of offense, but that soul tie of somebody that doesn't even know you have a soul tie with. You could be offended with somebody that don't even live in this state, and you're connected to them because you won't let it go. All right? Does that make sense? You guys all got this? All right, cool. So soul ties happen through that too. All right, so number. Uh, let me uh, give you um, some reasons why you get offended, all right? First one, everybody got this? Can I erase this? All right. Anybody want to take a picture of it? Just go ahead. Wow, that just made me offended. <laughs> and that was valid. <laughs> That's a reality right there, and everybody heard it. All right, so let's talk about reasons why we get offended, all right? Number one, all right? Let me put here, reasons we get offended. I love my handwriting. Don't say nothing. Number one, ready? Unrealistic expectations. That's like one of the biggest deals. You put, un, you put unrealistic expectations on people, and you don't guess so, you don't know so. You need to have conversation, and you need to express what this relationship looks like. You have to tell people, this is what I'm expecting out of this relationship. This is what I'm expecting out of this job, this is what I'm expecting out of you being a part of this ministry or a part of this organization, whatever it may be. If somebody just leaves you high and dry and then they expect something from you and you're not doing it, what are they going to do? They're going to get offended because why are you not doing your job? It's the same way with you expect someone to pour into you, but you haven't explained that. So now you're mad because the other person that came up to them and said, I want you to pour into me is being poured into. And you're like, why they, what's so special about them? They opened their mouth. That's the special part. They, they weren't afraid to come up to you and say, hey, can you pour into me? <laughs> Some people get offended by, because of these unrealistic expectations. And here's the thing. One of the things that uh, Marisol and I really wanted to get across early on when we started um, the ministry was especially when we got into sonship and we started talking about spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers and all these things and, and, and how confusing that got. 
I'm going to say it again. A spiritual parent is a parent to parent you in spiritual things. They're not your mommy and your daddy. I got three kids, Elijah, David, and Nevaeh. They came from me, from her, birth. That's my kids. Y'all my kids in the spirit, so I'll carry you in the spirit and I'll help you in spiritual things. But when you expect me to be like your dad, that's where it's an unrealistic expectation. Because I didn't grow up with you, so I don't know how you acted. I know you act a fool now because of what took place, but you can't blame me. You see what I'm saying? So I think that every time we put false expectations on people or un unrealistic ones, we cause ourselves to get into a realm of offense very quickly. Instead of just saying, hey, this is what I expect out of this relationship. I remember sitting down with uh, Pastor Blake, right, and Pastor Alex very early on. Very early on, Alex, we love you, miss you. Um, and um, we sat down at, at uh, Larry's, and she was like, she was straight up, she was like, I don't see you as, a, as mom and dad, but I will respect you as apostle and prophet. And I was like, that's perfectly fine. Because what did she do? She put the expectation down, and we all agreed. We we're like, that's fine. You know what I'm saying? So I think that when you put yourself out there and say, this is what I expect, then guess what? There's no room for offense. But if you don't say what you need, and this isn't anything, relationship, marriage with your children, whatever, you got to say what it is. Unrealistic expectations are always going to cause offense because somebody's going to do something that you didn't like. But if you did understand and just say, hey, this is what I expect, then guess what? They can't get mad because, hey, we already had this conversation. This is what it is. Go ahead. Um, I think this is not, I think I know that many of our majority of our arguments was because of this. <laughs> Very early on in our, our Oh, you're talking marriage. about marriage. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. In our marriage where... Because you would think it in your head, expect me to know what you're thinking in your head, and then I would think it in my head and expect you to know, and then when you didn't know, and I didn't know, it blew up. Right. Anybody there? But you ain't say <laughs> nothing. You just mad. Your, your, your just whole mad. thought process is, why, why? Did, why he ain't wash the dishes? Why she ain't do this? Why she ain't... <laughs> but you ain't say nothing. So you just walking by, <laughs> and he's walking by, hmm. And there's no conversation. The home, you hear that? The home. And you know that whole thing about the blow up over a kernel of rice on the floor. It's just about to blow up. The whole thing just about to go crazy over one little thing. The kernel. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just one little thing. You oh. were supposed to. No, you were about to. Well, the chocolate powder that was on the table today, but no. That wasn't like my fault though. <laughs> Dang, she really want to want to go there right now, huh? <laughs> I hold no, no offense joke, toward that. Yeah, it's a joke. <laughs> it's a joke. Before I would have got mad, but now I wanted to get mad. <laughs> All that chocolate that fell on the floor. Oh my gosh, that was hype. That was. I, I, uh, I handled it well though. He he did. He's I didn't even better. scream. I just went and got the vacuum. <laughs> I didn't even yell, nothing. I so was very before good. I would have been like, you didn't see the chocolate on the table? You know what I mean? But I was like, hey, babe, <laughs> there's still some chocolate here. And he I was, was like, like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, was, he didn't, I, didn't I didn't see, see that. <laughs> I didn't see it. I didn't see it. So I kindly wiped it off she myself. Did. Praise God. And I was very God. grateful for that. <laughs> But we had to grow into this, okay, y'all? Because before... But that would have been bad. It, it would have been a fight. But I think uh, we have mutually have told each other, hey, uh, in a sense, this is what you do. This is what I'm going to do. And we mutually can help around the house because for many years, I kept on telling him, I feel like I'm doing it by myself. Yeah. I feel like I'm doing it by myself. And... Many times I was like, 
I keep on expressing this to you and you don't care. And at times he didn't care and at times he didn't know how to go about it. Yeah. But um, I'm saying this because in marriages it's very important to clearly define certain things because this unrealistic expectation can really get you guys in bad moods yeah, and it's not blow. worth it. Yeah. And so this even goes for the home, um, how to do your finances. This goes for bedtime, like the other extracurricular activities, those kind of things. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. All of you it. know when we was we when we was in a, in a uh, when we did our thing for for the marriage. You know, if you like it over here, like it over there, you gotta say something because if not, you're you're gonna have a not so good of a time. And you're gonna be mad. Right. So you want to be satisfied and be happy in your marriage. You need to be open and honest. Now, I know for some people it's hard to be open and honest. Because they feel like they're walking on eggshells with their spouse. Right? I know for some people it's like that. Or just people in general. Or Right. Or people in general that you feel like you have to wait um, and tell them something. You shouldn't say silence because someone else uh, is going to blow up. That's unfair. And so you have to pray and ask the Holy Spirit when is the right time. Even if you have to write a letter, even whatever you need to do, even if you might need someone to that you trust that could you can bring in mediate. to to mediate, mm -hmm. because it's very important that we learn how to communicate with one another, right. because you shouldn't live unhappy. So, an unrealistic expectations. Number one, they must be expressed. Your expectations have to be expressed, guys. If you don't express them. How will anybody know? And express doesn't mean to do it, you know, in a, in a rude way or a disrespectful way. It just means, hey, this is what I don't like. This is what I do like. This is what I would like out of this relationship. This is what I expect, you know. And so you have to be very clear with that. And then the second thing is they have to be realistic. Can't be no crazy expectations has to be realistic. And so in anything, that has to be expressed and it has to be realistic. If it can't be realistic and it can't be expressed, then you have these things called unrealistic expectations. Because now you're creating a whole entire fantasy world in your head about this person that's not even that person. Yeah, go ahead. Don't worry, guys. We're going to get something called a, a, a crowd mic. That's going to be connected yeah. so that everybody can just talk and okay. it could be heard. Awesome. Um, this is good. I was listening to something the other day, and Dr. Um, Rosa Jones was talking about expectations, and she was um, she was talking about the expectations she put on herself for the year, right? Okay. And just talking about like planning for the next year and everything. Um, and she said she didn't meet some of her expectations for the year. And some people didn't meet her expectations for the year. But just because someone doesn't meet your expectations doesn't mean it's bad. Yeah. So, and it was so good because it's it's true. Like when you have these unrealistic expectations, anything less than that, it's bad. It's negative. You know, it's and just a negative. They might have done the best they possibly right. could, but because up here you're like, exactly. Why didn't you do that? Yeah. And she said that, and it was so good, and it's. It just goes so perfectly with this, where just because it's your expectation doesn't mean that something less than that is bad. It can yeah. still be very good. Yeah. But it's and it could be very, very good. And the thing is, is that again, this all derives from being offended. So because this person maybe was able to have uh, ninety-nine percent amazing results. That 1% was not met, and now you're like, you failed. You failed me. But what about the 99% that I put in? Yeah. It's just the 1% that just makes you go, uh-uh. And then that makes you get offended. So imagine you being offended over 1% or 5% out of 100. Mm. And then you just end up with a spirit of offense because you couldn't see the good of what everybody, what was done throughout that whole year. 
Like, if you just take, like, look at the whole year, right? We're in the 12th month of the year, right? If you look at the whole year going in, and all you can see is the 5% of what went wrong and not the 95% of what was blessed and what was awesome, then you're looking at the wrong lens. And you're going to go right into the new year offended again. You know what I'm saying? Go ahead, Steve. So I was, I was just thinking about when we, uh, when we were in our church. Years ago, we had a lot of needs. And, of course, you know, being a small church. And, year, and week after week, I'd say to people, you know, we, we, we need help. You know, we have a lot of things going on in the church. We, we need supplies. Why don't you give a little extra? I did the whole speech, right? Nothing. One day I'm talking to my mom, and my mom is a high-ranking person in FedEx, and she's like, why don't you just spell out what you need? Why don't you just be very clear and say, I need this, 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 this. And she said, well, watch what happens. I did it. Within a month, we had everything we needed. Yeah, because it wasn't just – because the thing is, when you just – it's like throwing out a little carrot and be like, hey, guys, somebody bite on that. Instead of saying, hey, this is the store. This is where it is. Yeah, clear. Exactly. Clear expectations. Go ahead. We got to get to the other ones too, so go ahead. I know, but this is really good though. Yeah. Um, no, not my, what I'm saying, I'm saying what you're saying. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this side, the way it came off, you were like, yeah, I know you're teaching good, but here, listen to this one. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. He said, I could have oh, okay. easily said, oh, perceived okay. that so wrong and ended up somewhere here. It was perception. No, it was perception. Deception. <laughs> Go ahead. Nah, I was just going to say that a lot of the times, um, uh, like unrealistic expectations like for us is that if you don't do it how I would do it, I automatically it's just like no, no, I, I like you didn't I'm still offended because it wasn't done to the ability that I would. So like yeah. even bringing it to um how mom was talking about your spouse and stuff like that. Um I remember having a conversation with a young man that was thinking about getting married. And I told him, I was like, you need to start now having conversations with your fiance, right? Because um, um, the way that you think something is clean isn't necessarily how she thinks something's clean. And and that that should that was just one thing. Twenty two years later, it's still uh, the uh, same. Uh, that joint ain't gonna change. Nah, I don't nah. care how long you've been married. But a lot of the time, a lot of times, that will that's be why until the day. like that <laughs> to the end. That's why offense um happens, especially in marriages and friendships <laughs> and whatever have you, because it's not done how you think that yeah, it should be done. Absolutely, and it's true. It's true. I mean, me and Marisol still. She be like, I wouldn't have done it that way. I, she asked me that too, and I'll be like. It's my clean. Because <laughs> I know what her clean looks like. And sometimes, I, you know, I do the Marisol clean, but most of the time I do the Eric clean. It's clean. It's just not clean like how she wants it. But, again, it's, it's about understanding that, you know, that everybody's different. So you're going to have different views and different things. But don't put those unexp uh, unrealistic expectations. Number two. Is this good? All right. Number two. Ready? Um, our own wounded spirit. I'm not going to say spirit. I'm going to say soul. Our own wounded soul. Now, the reason why we get offended. So a lot of times we use our wounds, listen to this, to filter and judge others. So everything is filtered through that wound. Everything is filtered through that, through that, that, that hurt and that, that uh, offense. So once you see one person, that person is the same way with everybody else. And so we have to be careful that we're not doing what Jesus told us not to do in um, Matthew chapter 7, verse 2. He says, uh, well, for verse 1 and 2, it says, don't judge others. And you will not be judged, but you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And so you got to deal with your own wound, okay? Some of us are wounded, and we don't know how to deal with it because we don't want to face it. And in not facing your wound, 
you'll end up filtering everyone and everything through that wound. And that wound will become what you perceive as life. And it's... She done popped gum. She knew she was in trouble, so she did it too. She was like... <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm good. No. So, uh, <laughs> so our own wounded spirits, right? So we have Jesus here, and he's speaking about judging others right now. He's saying that the house of the judgment starts at the house of the Lord. We know that. So we are to judge one another. But here's the thing. Don't get so judgmental and don't expect it not to happen to you. He says that. So we have to be careful that our wounds aren't judging and filtering everyone we come across. You can come in. So when, when we're dealing with these wounds, right, the first thing is acknowledging them. If you don't acknowledge a wound, and what can a wound look like? Well, there's daddy wounds. There's mommy wounds. There's sibling wounds. There's wounds of, of um, abuse. There's wounds of all kinds of things, neglect, abandonment. These are all wounds that if they are nursed correctly, become spirits in your life. So you have to be careful that you're not just allowing the wound to filter into your soul to the point that now everyone is that. You know, you hear it all the time, uh, uh, someone gets hurt in a relationship, and the next person is going to be the same way. Now, one of the hardest things to do, okay, I, I, I know this is very hard to do. I thank God that I don't have a difficulty with this, but many people do, is after they get hurt, they don't know how to put down the guard. And so they're guarded and never experience real relationship. I've, I've been hurt plenty of times. I'll probably be hurt again. It happens. One thing that I've done is I will hurt, but I won't wound. I'm going to say that again. I'll hurt, but I won't wound. In other words, I'll get ointment on that thing and make sure that that thing is taken care of before it becomes an open wound that I just want to show everybody a scar. I don't want to do that. If I can deal with it, then I'll deal with it. And so the quicker you deal with it, guess what? The quicker it heals. And some of these wounds are really deep for us. Some of these wounds are so deep that we forgot that they're there. Because you got other wounds and other scars and other things going on. But it's the one deep wound that is causing you to forget or the other wounds, are ne you're neglecting the one that will really heal it all. And so we have to be careful that in our offense, we're not resenting and then becoming part of and then partnering with the spirit of offense that will wound our soul. And now it's going to be really hard to deal with things because now we're wounded and it's us. We can't look at nobody else. When you're wounded, you have to look at yourself. That's the hardest thing. Because, first off, when you're wounded, you have excuses. It's not my fault. I didn't do anything. They did it to me. I'm bleeding because of them. I'm hurt because of them. But you have to remember, it takes two to tango. It happens together. It happens one and one. One and one equals two, right? So you can't have a wound unless you're self-inflicting yourself. And that can happen too because you want people to feel bad for you. But either way, you have to deal with these open wounds in your soul and you, or you will filter and judge others by these wounds. And you see people. Some of us you know, we got married and had wounds. So how do you look at your marriage? Through a wound. So we have to be careful that we're not looking at things, our job, even God. We can view God through a wound. Like, 
I, I, I can't remember how many times I've talked to people and they have a difficulty going to God as Abba. They can go to him as king. He's my king. He's my judge. He's my ruler. He's all of that. But what about your father? Oh, no, I, can't, I, don't, I don't know how to go to him. I never had a father. I never had a father either, but I know how to go to him as a father. You got to learn to deal with that wound. Once you deal with that wound, you'll be able to confront what it is, that is wound, that's wounded you. And we have to do that. Or we'll remain in a place of offense, which is a snare, which is a trap, and you will remain what? Locked up. Amen? All right. The third thing that causes us to, to uh, remain offended, reasons we get offended, is because we hold on to things too long. We hold on to things too long. How many of us have done that? We just hold on to things too long. I've done that. It's not cool. Like, the worst thing in the world is silence when you're offended. Because guess what happens? Your mind goes crazy. You start thinking about things. You start putting scenarios. And you start doing all this stuff. And you're like, you, you, by, by the time you're, you're mentally exhausted over something that might not even really happen. You know, I find myself sometimes, like the other day, somebody had hit me up. And, um, and they were like, I need to talk to you right away. And the first thing I thought was, oh, gosh, what did I do? <laughs> But I had to deal with it. I'm like, I didn't do nothing. I'm like, no, what the heck? Get, off, get that monkey off my back. That's not, that's not, I didn't do anything. So I know I'm good. Like, if this person come at me, it's perceived because I did nothing. I've been trying to be really good. I've been trying to be on my P's and Q's, dotting my T's, uh, crossing my T's, dotting my I's. I'm trying to do everything good as much as I can. Not offending, you know what I mean? None of that. And... Then they, so I was at my job, and I was like, I'm going to call you right now because I'm not, I'm not going to be working, dealing with this in my head because now I'm not going to be able to work right and all this stuff. And then they had some great news, and I was calm. But when that first thing hit me, I was like, oh, I still deal with this. I can't get upset when somebody says they want to talk to me right away. But that showed me that I still had something there. So I was like, Lord, you gotta, I got to deal with this. So immediately I was like, I want to check this. So I've been praying and like, Lord, I want this to go away. And when I see a phone call, I'm not thinking the worst of it, you know. So, again, when you go through these things, you got to deal with yourself. That's nothing that that person put on me. That's what I had still inside that I felt I thought I had got rid of. And I was like, oh, wait up. And sometimes me and Marisol, we'd be like, people want to have a meeting with us or whatever. We'd be like, oh, gosh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Here we go again. But it's not like that. It's a praise, praise God that it's not. But, again, it's because of the past without dealing with this or holding on to things too long, we end up in that situation where everything triggers that way. We don't want it to be that way. Go ahead, Steve. A, a friend of ours um, was counseling us years ago, and I am the same way, Apostle. You and I are right here. And that would drive me crazy when somebody would say, I need to talk to you. And I'm like, the worst thing that will happen. So he had a term for it. It's called awfulizing. <laughs> awfulizing. I like that. <laughs> and what you do is, you, okay, let's just say for anybody here, all of a sudden your boss says, I I'm need to see you. I'm coming against that. <laughs> right? Your boss says, I need to see you. So the first thing you think of is, I'm going to get fired. What did I do wrong? Or you're a, a family member or something, and you start going down this dark road, and all they want to do is tell you, hey, you did a great job. Yeah. But in the exactly. meantime, you're scared to death because your awful list has got to be the worst and everything else. When I talk to people now, if I text them and say I want to talk to them, I'll tell them there's nothing bad. Yeah. It's all good. Just wanna, I just want to run something by you. Yeah. And that's the cue that whew, we're good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's good. But, again, when you're dealing with something like that in the soul wound area, then you're going you're gonna to feel those things. Now, holding on to things too long. This can be something, I wrote this in my notes. I said, let it go, because if not, you'll be frozen. 
Where's the drummer? Badoom. But guess what? It's true. You will stay frozen. You will stay stuck if you hold on to things too long because it becomes weight now. And you're weighted down by the things that you won't let go of. And some of you got to just let go. You know, we online, you have to let go. You got to learn to just allow God to deal with the situation and just let it go. If you don't let it go, you can end up with Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Let's go there. Because everybody loves Hebrews 11, but Hebrews 12 is where it's at. Hebrews 11, oh, we love the hall of faith and we love dealing with, you know, call those things that be not as though they were. The faith is the evidence of things hoped for and the substance of things not seen. And then it goes all through the hall of faith and he talks about all these things. Then in verse 12, it's the discipline. And he goes, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily what? entraps us or trips us up and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. So what do we need to do in order to run the race correctly? We have to let things go, which means that you can't hold on to things too long. You will remain offended if you hold on to, long, to things very long. You'll just stay there. Some of us, some people you know, they're, they're not upset at what's happening right now. They're upset at what happened. And so they're just angry about all of it, and they just stay. You ever met a bitter person? A bitter person is upset and angry at everything because they did not deal with something and they held on to it. The worst, the worst thing is that people end up really, really bad when they hold on to something and then that person passes. And then I'm here to talk to them. They got to learn how to deal with that. Oh, I should have said something. I should have, you know. This and that. Like one of my favorite artists probably deals with this on a very heavy, heavy way. NF. All his songs are just pretty much about resentment <laughs> and offense and anger. <laughs> but but he, does, he makes him, it makes him an amazing artist. I always said if he gets deliverance, he probably loses his career. <laughs> He's amazing, though. He's amazing. Marisol said that. And so it's amazing, right? Um, but do we want to hold on to things too long? Right? Now, here's the question. How long is too long? Go ahead, get Mike. Where you at, man? Come on. Uh, I was going to say too long is when it takes your peace, okay. even if it's for a little bit. So, of course, naturally, you're going to have some feelings that can last an hour, a day. You don't know how long. But when you find that it's repeatedly taking a piece every time you think about it, sucks a piece right out of you. Great day or, or a great week. You're having, you know, everything's going normal. And the second you think about it, it takes all your peace, kills the whole week. So the second it has that type of power to just suck the peace right out of you, yeah, it has the second the, it, it has that power. It has that. You, okay, so the second it has the power to suck the peace out of your life or to build anxiety, to build, you know, um, all these different things, that's when it's too long, you know. Sometimes it's too long when <clears throat> you can't sleep and you're tossing and turning and you're thinking about it, right? Now, Jesus said that he came to give us what? Peace that surpasses all understanding. So, we, we, look at Judah walking around smiling. He's so cute. Um, it's like Maddox, but now it's Judah. My goodness gracious. So um, when, when we see this happening and holding on to things too long, what we're doing is we are now babysitting our offense. And we're parenting it. We're letting it grow up. We're giving it food so that we become a parent to it. And now that offense is dependent on you. 
because now you're you're just and you're nurturing it, you're nursing it, you're taking care of it, you know. And so what happens is when it holds on too long, the offense matures, but you immature. Did y'all catch that? The offense matures while you immature. And so when you say something out of your mouth, you're not saying it from you. You're saying it from the, from the, from the spirit, from the, from the mature offense. That's why some people can remain offended their whole life and know how to talk around people. But you'll never know they're offended until it reveals itself. So you could be really cool and offended. You could be really nice and offended. You could be very thoughtful and offended. You can get ramakate and be offended. You can sing on the worship team and be offended. You can preach and be offended. Don't forget, you got to pick up your, your son. Yeah, A15 in, in my coat. So we have all this going on, right? Now, look how crazy this is. We can hold on to it. And it become part of our nature. And you don't even know you're offended anymore because now it's just you. Yeah, it becomes a personality. It just becomes who you are. And as it becomes who you are, now you really don't want to let it go because you don't know how to function without the offense. And that's the worst place to be because a lot of people that, unoffend and get unoffended and don't get offended anymore at whatever they were offended at, now need to think about other things other than the offense. What does my mind take up now? What do I speak about now? How do I talk about this now? What do I say? What do I do? My whole life revolved around this offense. And now I don't have it anymore. So now I got to learn how to function without it. It's a dysfunction. But to us, it's what? Function. It's normal, right? So as we deal with this situation, we have to learn to let it go. Or you remain, that's right, frozen. Exactly. And that was pun intended. I did that on purpose, okay? I did that on purpose. Where are you going? Oh, we're fed. Thank you. Thank you. I said oh. your heart becomes calloused. Yes. Your heart becomes callous. And what happens is this. Any person trying to come into your off. life, right. you fight. <laughs> Any person that's trying to, that's why, listen, most people that walk through our doors here at the center, the first thing they do is, this can't be real. But why are they saying that? It's not saying that because they don't believe it. They're saying it because they're putting their, their wall up. Like, nah, this ain't real. This can't be true. There's no way. And so when we deal with something too long, we end up with walls. And we end up putting ourselves in a place. Go ahead. There's two more. Go ahead. I was saying that our heart <laughs> become callous and you become numb yes. to situations to people, to things, because at, at certain times is you don't want to deal with it. Yeah. And so you psych yourself out and keep on saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And in a sense, in a sense, you um, allow yourself to not feel the emotions because you are tired of feeling. Absolutely. You're tired of feeling. That's good. Um, number four, right? Assuming a negative intent. In other words, you always off a lion. You're always thinking something uh, negative, or you're thinking negative of the person. I like to say it like this, hope nobody gets offended, but when you assume, you become these three letters right here, okay, King James version of a donkey, 
Okay, I'm not going to say the word, but you can look at those three words, three letters, and know exactly what it is. You assume so much, you look like a, because, exactly. So you got to be careful because assumption will always make you look like this. Because the, the worst, right, you ever been there? I've been there. I've looked like this before. I assume something, then it doesn't assume like that, and then you gotta look at, you gotta stand there like this, like <laughs> real dumb, just looking stupid, just looking real dumb, <laughs> and you can't get out of it either. You're just like, what? I mean, I just thought that though. <laughs> now you're looking like an e-haul for real, for real, for real, for real. Go ahead, Zion. <laughs> And to some, that's one thing, one of the little nuggets that I would teach in my workshops on Zoom, how I feel like assumption is the lowest form of intelligence. Because mm. even the word talks about how if you answer something before, if you answer a matter before you hear a matter, it's foolish. Yeah. And that's literally what an assumption is. You don't even know the uh, fullness of a certain thing, and you're just thinking of the, uh, you're thinking of the outcome before it's even revealed to you. And most of the times, you're not just thinking about it, you're speaking it. So Proverbs 18, 21 tells us that the, the tongue can bring death or life, and those who love it will reap, those who love to talk will reap the consequences of it, or you'll eat the fruit of what you're saying. And so we got to be careful that what we're doing is not gossiping or backbiting or tearing somebody down without knowing all the facts. And a lot of us, we do that. We don't know all the facts, but we tear people down. Listen, if you don't know all the facts, pray. And if you still feel like you shouldn't be a part or you still feel like this is something that is, is not right, then just kindly separate yourself. But don't go around because the worst thing you do is when assuming a negative intent, the first thing that happens most of the time is that an offended person is going to tell another offended person. Or they're going to try to drag in somebody into this equation. Most offended people don't like going by themselves. So we have people who want to continue this vial of offense. And it spews like poison on so many other people. And if you're not really listening for the Lord, you'll get bit. And that poison will infect you as well. Many people Oh, okay, Proverbs 18, Proverbs 18, 3, Proverbs 18, 21. Look those scriptures up. Now here's the thing. I'm gonna talk about two people here, and then we're gonna finish up. All right. So number five is forgiveness. Unforgiveness. You remain offended. All right, unforgiveness. But as we're talking about this, I want to talk about a specific, uh, I'm going to go back to the unforgiveness. That's how I'm going to end this. But I want to talk about something that took place early on in time. Let's go to, Genesis chapter 4. Because God showed me something so amazing just a few uh, hours ago as I was reading it. Okay. It's the story of Cain and Abel. You were going to teach on that tonight? You can do it on, just, just piggyback on it. There you go. Look at you. We in the vein. That's what's up. So, Cain and Havel, or Cain and Abel, as they call them in, uh, in English. Now, Adam had sexual relations with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portion of the firstborn lambs from his flock. 
the Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Now, last week, Prophet Marisol talked about what? Anger and offense. So what made Cain uh, angry? Offense. He was offended that God was accepting Abel's and not his. Like, God, I brought something too. How can you accept his and not mine? Now, he looked dejected. Verse 6 says, why are you so angry, the Lord said to Cain, or the Lord asked Cain, why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out because sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must, be, you must subdue it and be its master. Now, what's funny is Cain grew with anger, and that anger eventually led to murder. But it started with offense. So you could go from offense to anger to murder. And you ain't got to kill somebody, but you can kill them with your words. You could kill them with the association of other offended people. You know when somebody is talking. You, you ever see uh, uh, when somebody um, is talking about you and you know it, and then you walk in the room and everybody be quiet? And what do you do? Do you say anything? No, you just be quiet. I mean, some people do. Uh, amen. We ready to fight then. Ready to fight. <laughs> like, oh, I'm right here though. You want to say something now? Oh, no? Chirp? Tweet? Crickets? All that. No, but seriously. Word, you're a punk. Prophet said you're a punk. No, right? So <laughs> you said it. I'm just saying what you said. Everybody knows that she said I ain't say that. She said it. Right? Say it to my face. All right. So look. So Cain eventually grew so murderous in his heart and his actions followed. But here's the thing. Why was Cain upset? Cain was upset because Abel was worshiping the Lord and Cain hated it for it, hated him for it. Some people don't like to see other people just win. Some people don't want to see other people really worship. They look at them like, oh, that's fake. You don't know what's going on in that person's life. You're, you're being a cane right now, right? So watch this. This is interesting, though. Remember how we always peg Cain as this mean bully brother and that he killed his brother? Now, remember, he was offended and sin crouched around to his door, and that opened up the door to murder that opened up to the first killing ever in, 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 uh, in the world, right? So look at what it says, though. It says here in verse 8, one day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out to the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him, which means that it wasn't the same day as the sacrifice. He went home and thought about this. Not only did he go home and thought about it, but he allowed the resentment and the offense to nurse to the point it became murder against his own brother. All right? So he was thinking about how can I kill Cain? I mean, how can I kill him? How can I kill Abel? Right? And God has already warned him, sin is at your door. So it says, afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain uh, responded. Am I my brother's guardian? That was pretty disrespectful to talk to God that way. Like, but here's the thing. No, but see, it's not crazy, though. It's, that's the thing. It's not, it's crazy to us. But Cain and Abel, just like Adam and Eve, walked with God. So that was, not a, that was not a disrespectful response. He was just talking to him like he normally did. To us, it seems, man, how dare you? But he, he, all, he was familiar with him. So when he asked him, where's your brother? He was like, I don't know. Am I his guardian? Like, you go find him. You walk with us every day. Now watch what happens here. The Lord says, uh, uh, then um, he says, but the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crops for you, no matter how hard you work. From now on, you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. 
Cain replied to the Lord, watch this. My punishment is too great for me to bear. You have banished me from the land, and look at what he says, and from your presence. You have made me a homeless wanderer. Now, this is what got me. Cain was not evil. An evil person doesn't want to be in the presence of God. Let's flip the whole script on how we see Cain. Because Cain just said, I don't want to be out of your presence. What person says that that is evil? I mean, that's not evil. An evil person be like, well, I don't want to be in your presence anyway. He wanted to be in the presence of God. He knew what it was to be in his presence. So he knew that he messed up. He knew that he killed his brother because of offense, but he didn't want to get banned, not from the land, from the presence of God. That right there shows me that Cain worshiped the Lord. It wasn't just Abel that worshiped. Because think about it. Did not Cain bring a sacrifice? That goes to show you that he was still following what God said. He just didn't do it the right way. Now, we don't know what that was, and I'm going to dive into that more Hebraic to find out really what's going on there. But what, what we need to realize is that Cain, although people want to pay him out to this murderous, nasty brother, he didn't want to get out of the presence of God. That right there shows me that he was sensitive to God and that his offense, man, who was the first person offended? Lucifer. So what does Lucifer want us to do? Get offended so that we lose our position with God. Lose the presence of God in our offense. We're murderous because what, by, what Jesus say? Jesus said, yeah, you have heard that if you kill somebody, but I say if you hate them. What does offense make you do? Hate somebody. Call him, a, call him a rocker, an idiot, whatever. Guess what you've done? A fool. Guess what you've done? You have just become like Cain. Killing your brother in the spirit. But do you want to be banished from the presence of God? So we got to stop looking at Cain like this guy is so like the devil's son. No, that was Adam and Eve's son. He knew what it was to be in the presence of the Lord. Now, how many people see that differently now? It's like, oh, well, dang. All right, Cain. Yeah. Yeah. And people have done worse than that. Well, not worse than Cain, but Cain killed his brother. He did. Oh, yeah, fool and all that. Yeah, of course. But the thing was, when I saw that he didn't want to abandon the presence of God, it showed me his heart. That his heart was not where it was supposed to be because he allowed sin to crouch and enter in. I'm sure Cain didn't want to kill his brother, but that sin came in. And that offense came in, and that resentment came in, and that anger came in, and to the point that that spirit began to drive him, and it was saying, kill your brother. Cain didn't want to do that, but the spirit that was behind him did it. And we know that God loved Cain because Cain wasn't allowed to be killed. He marked them, and anybody that kills you will have to deal with me, he says. That means that God still marked Cain because Cain had a special place in God's heart. Oh, my gosh. This is a different way to look at this. It's not just he was a murderous dude and he killed his brother and then God banished him. God banished Adam and Eve from the garden, but they were still in the presence of God. Listen, this wasn't done in the garden, and yet they kept hearing God's voice. Man. They kept hearing God. And here's the thing. This is where you got to look at all this. Cain could discern God's voice. <laughs> it wasn't like he was hearing the devil. He knew the voice of God. That's why he answered him. I don't know where my brother's at. I'm not his guardian. He was listening very intently, and he heard the voice of God. And the thing was, he didn't even run from what he did. He regretted it. He didn't want to be banned, especially from the presence of God. 
but he was. So that was another fall. His dad fell, and now Cain fell. Generational curse. You see it right there. So we look at this, and it comes from offense, right? So the last one is unforgiveness. Let's go to Matthew chapter 28. Give me four minutes, and we're done. Matthew chapter 28. Let's get there quickly. When you got to say, I got it. Matthew 28, verse 21 and 22. All right, 28, 21, no, Matthew 20, sorry, not Matthew 28, Matthew, where's that, oh, that's David, oh, my goodness, where's that, I'm bugging, it's not 28, I think it's Matthew 21, let me look. Okay, give me a few minutes, sorry. I don't know why. Thought I had that written down right. I don't think I did. I think I wrote it wrong. Hold on, give me a few minutes. No, a few seconds. I'm going to get it. I don't know why I have it written in that. Oh, Matthew 18, that's why. I wrote the wrong thing. Matthew 18, 21 and 22. Sorry, got it now. All right, we're good now. Okay, so it says here, Then Peter came to him, asked him, Lord, how often should I forgive someone? All right, now this is a funny thing because Peter is really trying to see if he's like the man. He's doing well with this. He goes, how many times should I, or should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? And Jesus replied, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Okay? Now, here's the thing about that. The number seven is what? Completion and fullness, right? But seven times 70 is what? 490. There's a numerical value or number in Hebrew that it means, 490 means tamim. Tamim is T-A-M-I-M. And it means to be perfect or complete. To be perfect or complete. So when Jesus tells Peter, I don't mean, not seven times, but seven times 70, 490, he knew exactly what he was saying. And what he was saying was, you cannot be complete if you don't forgive. Your faith cannot be complete, watch this, if you can't speak on what hurts you. Your faith can't be complete without talking about what offended you. Your faith can't be complete without letting it go. How do you do that? How do you let it go? How do you talk about it? How do you make sure that uh, you, um, you don't resent, you don't hold on, you don't unforgive? You have to forgive. Now, here's the thing. Forgiveness in this day and age is a process. Okay? It's not an overnight. It's a process. And some processes take longer than others. But you have to begin the process because when you begin the process of forgiveness, your, watch this, your offense begins to get dealt with and now you're becoming a whole person again and you don't have that wound. That's why he said the number 490 the way he said it. See, for us, we think 490 just means, like, do it all day long. That's not what he's talking about. He's telling us that without this, it's not complete. So forgiveness is something that is the top thing when it comes to offense. Because here's the thing. Sometimes you might not ever talk to that person again that offended you. You might never see them again, but you have to forgive them. And it's not for them. 
is for you. You cannot end up this way. So that's today. Amen. Next week, Prophet will be back, and she'll be talking more about Cain and Abel. I'm excited about that, Cain and Abel. Um, we want to collect offering now uh, for today, and, uh, and we want to tell everyone, please be here Saturday, okay, On the 28th of this month, we're going to do painting and healing. Painting and healing. That's going to be great. Um, so this week, uh, we're still going to be talking about offense because the whole series for the month of December is why you, why are you, why are you or why are you offended? Why are you offended? Good. Okay. So why are you offended? This Saturday, I'm going to be teaching on Saul, King Saul, and how he was offended with David. And what that brought, tormenting spirits and all kinds of stuff. So offense just doesn't hit your soul with a wound, but it brings some demons too. And we'll be talking about that on Saturday. So make sure that you um, be here on time, 11 a.m. for worship. And then, you know, what the Lord wants to do. Also, Saturday night at 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock, I'm going to be doing a teaching it's going to be about an hour long, okay, from 6 to 7. It's going to be an hour long, so we need everybody to be here on time. I'm going to be doing a teaching on the Feast of Dedication. I'm going to be doing a teaching on Hanukkah, and I'm going to be uh, doing that. It's going to be very good. I'm going to tag team with Gina, and uh, we got a lot of stuff that we're going to talk about within that hour. Um, and we want to just give an opportunity for people to hear of what a wonderful feast this really is in our lives. Um, so let's just stand to our feet. We're going to pray. And then you guys can uh, put the money in the basket. Um, no, here's the thing. I, I, I want you to understand something, okay? When it comes to all the things that we're going to teach this year, all the feasts, all the festivals, all these things, I want you to know something very clearly, okay? I, I, I've learned something. It's not obligation, it's invitation. It's not obligation, it's invitation. And when you're invited to something that beautiful, why not take the invitation? But that's up to you. Nothing that we're going to teach here, nothing that I'm going to speak on, on the feast and the festivals, are going to be something that are going to be demanded or going to be um, forced. Like the teaching I'm going to do on Saturday, you'll hear about it. I've been studying on it. I'm like, this is beautiful. You don't have to do these things. And it doesn't, and if you don't, it doesn't mean that you're not a part of this center. Do you understand that? So I want people, I want to make that clear. I want to make it real clear because last year we had some jacked up stuff happen right after the beginning of the year. So we're not going to have that. I'm going to make it clear. This is an expectation that I'm making clear. We do not force anything here. Do you understand that? If you still want to celebrate Christmas, that's on you. Nobody's telling you not to do that. I'm not going to say that from here either. Do you understand that? Everybody clear with that? So if you see somebody put up a tree, don't knock them. Don't be like, oh. And if you don't see somebody put up a tree, you see somebody put up a Hanukkah, don't knock them either. Let's just stay neutral on these things, okay, because everybody still has work to do here. Amen? So that's clear, right? Everybody say that's clear. Amen. Let's pray. So Abba, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for the teaching, Lord God. We thank you for dealing with our souls. We thank you, Lord God, that we're able to walk in a freedom because you are truly showing us, Lord God, what it is to be a part of your kingdom. Lord, if there's anyone here still dealing with offense or dealing with some type of resentment, Lord, that they would begin to deal with it before that spirit of offense begins to tag along and tie itself and so wound, Lord God, that situation. We come against it now, Lord, and we thank you because you're freeing us in this place. And Lord, I pray, Lord God, for what is going to be uh, received today, Lord God, as giving, whether it's offering or tithes, Lord, may it, Lord God, go completely to the plan and the purpose of what you want to do here at this center. We thank you for it. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name.
Amen and amen. Listen online, we love you. Be with us this Saturday. God bless you. See you guys soon.